Nobody's perfect, nobody's wise, but to feel the kind of pain in a way of lacking wisdom and to crave it and to realize it's the most important thing in life and to dedicate your life to this kind of endless journey is really what life is actually all about. You're a cognitive behavioral therapy trained psychologist. Why are you writing yeah. about Marcus Aurelius? That's a really good question. Because actually my first love was philosophy. And uh, I, I think I came to philosophy looking for a philosophy of life, really. You know, something that would help me uh, feel better about life, cope with adversity. And I didn't find it at university when I was doing my philosophy degree. And so then I started training in psychotherapy and stuff like that. Then after that, I realized I'd missed something, which is the one school, one major school of ancient philosophy that you don't normally study and an undergraduate philosophy curriculum. Uh, so it's like the, the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone kind of thing. And so I discovered stoicism, and I thought, this is the thing that I was looking for the whole time I was at university, and nobody ever told me about. And uh, so I got into stoicism, and I realized it was also the philosophical inspiration for cognitive therapy. Not a lot of people know that. So the two things wedded together. And I thought, oh, cognitive therapists must all be really into stoicism then. And it turned out they weren't. So I ended up writing a book about that. And I thought, oh, this is a nerdy, obscure subject that no one's ever going to be interested in. I'm never going to be talking about this on podcasts or anything like that in the future. And then it's weirdly, it became trendy I, a few years after I started writing about it. And I got dragged into this thing that suddenly people were getting tattooed on them and stuff like that. It kind of became a bit uh, hip. Just as I was getting a little bit old, actually, I feel like, you know, <laughs> I'm, get, I'm getting older now. It's you missed the boat. Young young kids that are into it and stuff. Uh, it's, I'm reliably told by the publishing industry that it's millennials that work in the tech industry that are the, the demographic that okay. are into stoicism. Why do you think mainly. that is? Well, see, the thing is, you know, I always think I'm in a very lucky position because I talk to so many people. So sometimes when I'm answering questions about stoicism, I think, oh, it's easy because I've asked them and they keep telling me why it is. So I'll tell you what they've told me, basically. So they tell me that they feel overwhelmed by social media and the news media bombarding them with alarmist stuff about things that aren't under their direct control. Like they think the media are trying to fear monger and instill hatred, like, which is accurate probably. And they, they don't know how to deal with that. And they feel that they need some kind of philosophy of life to cope with it. Um, but like Nietzsche said, you know, God is dead. Um, but we're still kind of living in his shadow. So they want something that's kind of like what Christianity used to do for our, our, our grandparents and so on. Um, but a lot of people today, especially I think in the tech industry, are, are quite rationalist and they, they want a secular philosophy that's based on reason rather than faith, revelation or tradition. And so they find in Stoicism, and there are historical reasons for this, uh, why they would, uh, a secular alternative to Christianity and a kind of secular, th they want something like CBT but that is bigger, that's a whole, like a Western yoga, they also say. <laughs> they, I'm just telling you all the stuff they tell me, man. It's like a weird interview. So like, uh, yeah, they tell me, we want a Western yoga, it's like Buddhism, but Western. And so they want more than CBT, they want a whole way of life. And so that's what Stoicism gives them. Yeah, I've been fascinated thinking about what we're missing with uh -huh. no no consistent religion anymore now and yeah. the most recent riots at the capital i think a, a part of that this anomie this normlessness that we've got at the moment tradition is out of the window where the science is the new god materialist reductionist yeah. standpoints on everything are the, are the victor yeah I just wrote an article about that yesterday. You're, you're right on the button there, buddy, with the topical aspect of this, for sure, because that's exactly what people are asking about. And it seems odd that people would say, well, there's this ancient Greek philosophy that might be really relevant to the riots on Capitol Hill. So, you know, I mean, I feel people hearing that might think that sounds really implausible. But, you know, already loads of people are saying, yeah, it's anime, like you're saying, it's disillusionment. You know, people have no sense of direction. They've lost touch with their values. And the more people are confused about their moral values, often the more kind of rigid and dogmatic, like, you know, and draconian they become 
uh, and trying to force their non-existent values on other people. Absolutely. Weird, paradoxically. And the more reflective people are about their values, you know, and in touch with them, the more flexible they tend to be about them, strangely. Um, so I think really, I paradoxically, there's a connection between the lack of deep, sincere moral self-examination in modern society and this kind of rigid dogmatic prejudice and also there's a there's a really obvious psychological angle to this and it's kind of it's just i don't know like it's so strange because it's glaringly obvious and nobody ever does anything really to address it on a societal level and that is we know that anger biases judgment and anger is related to political prejudice and racial prejudice and religious prejudice. That's been known for decades. Um, and yet we allow the media to go crazy, like provoking anger and fear uh, in social media, like partly because it's very structured, kind of fueling that, escalating things like crazy. And so it's no surprise that prejudices like begin to proliferate in society. We need to help people manage their anger and we need to help them reflect on their values. And weirdly, those are two f things that Stoicism is fundamentally interested in. Marcus Aurelius had big problems with anger, didn't he? I think based on yeah. what I know about him, that was probably the biggest vice emotion that he had. He, he says that. I mean, we've, we've got slender evidence, really, but he says... Uh, in the meditations that he was worried he was going to lose his temper a few times and do something that he'd regret. And he's very preoccupied with anger, but so are other Stoics. I, I think he had problems managing his own anger, though. Um, on the other hand, the histories. So we have these two sides of Marx Aurelius. We have what he writes himself in his private journal. So kind of the, the inner psychological story. And it, it, uh, by the way, there's internal evidence that's fairly convincing to most scholars that this was never intended for publication. I agree with that. I think it seems unlikely that this was meant for publication, whereas Seneca's letters are were definitely literary devices and they, they were clearly meant for publication. Um, but in private, Marcus talks about his anger. In public, the histories of his reign um, seem to say the opposite, that he was very calm he wasn't easily provoked. There was one time when he lost his temper and ordered the beheading of a Germanic chieftain. But then he, he walked it back and sent the guy into exile. What, after instead. he had his head chopped off? No, not after he had. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mate. We'll just stitch that back on. We can stitch it back on. Don't worry. Don't worry. We'll fix that. Like a bit of glue or something. Yeah, you know, yeah. You'll be right as rain. No, no. Like, I think he gave the order and then walks it back. He sent the guy into exile instead. Who was but, it? I was so I was reading this morning, doing my research. Uh -huh. Was it Augustus that stabbed a slave in the eye with a spear and then apologized afterward and was like, What do You're you want? Close. And and the guy said, I just want my eye back. I love that story. You're very close. It was Hadrian, and it was actually a stylus. It's a thing that, like a fountain pen, basically, you know? Like they use this metal. <laughs> That's such a childish paper. thing to do. I know. Like, it's like a kid having a. T like, a lot of people that lose their temper in history, they do seem like toddlers, like having a. M Hadrian. People love Hadrian. I'm writing about Hadrian at the moment, and I really see him as a giant toddler. <laughs> like, he's incredibly vain and uh, bad-tempered and paranoid and, you know, like... But, yeah, he stabbed this guy in the eye and he said, what could, is there anything I can do to make it up for you? And the guy said, all I want is my eye back. That's a great story because it shows... And the Capitol Hill riots are, funnily enough, an example of that. Sometimes when people do things in anger, they cause harm that can easily be repaired or maybe completely irreparable. That's one of the things that we should try and do a lot, surely, to take that third party perspective and make the action that we would have wanted us to do in the freshness of mind that we'll have tomorrow morning, not in the heat of the moment right now. That would be a great idea. Like you should, uh, you should spread the word about that. I think you know. I think that. I think if everyone did that. You know, the world would be a much rosier place, wouldn't it? But people act on impulse. Actually, it's very interesting that, that that's generally true, that, that most of those people who rioted and stuff, if you got them in a calmer moment, they would probably say, oh, I would never do that. But, you know, when people do crazy things, they often surprise themselves. 
Because your brain goes into a different mode of functioning, actually, and all these biases kick in, and you're no longer reasoning clearly. Like you start underestimate, oh, you, we know that people underestimate risk when they're angry. They jump to premature conclusions. They make sweeping generalizations and stuff like that. Like, so your brain's in a different mode of functioning and your thinking is foggy. So yeah, you're right. The Stoics have this strategy that's like a, a timeout strategy, we'd call it in therapy, which is knowing that you're in this crazy state in the fog of war, wouldn't it make sense once you spotted that to go, yeah, hang on a minute, I, may, I should maybe wait until I've calmed down a bit and then I'll decide, you know, like whether I want to kick in the door to the uh, the Capitol building or, you know, like... Pick up speaky, Speaker Pelosi's lectern and yeah. carry it down there. It really a good idea. Fuck, did you see, did, Donald, did you see this? So I saw this unbelievable photo where they'd stormed the Capitol building and they were going through the entranceway, but they'd stayed inside of the ropes, the walkway. Really? Wow, I didn't see that. Like, I saw a video where the cops, I don't know what was going on, actually. As, as you know, I'm not even going to say it. But some of this, whatever went on there, it was really quite shocking. And uh, at the same time, though, you know, I should say the Stoics advise us to say not to be shocked by things, but to say, you know, to remind ourselves, in a sense, we should have seen this coming. Uh, you know, whatever. Well, it, it I, happened. It yeah. happened. It can't be unbelievable because it happened. Yeah. I know. Actually, people were predicting it. You know, one of my friends wrote an article last November, like, the you know, talked about exactly this sort of thing happening. And uh, so it's like people have been telling us for ages. Uh, it's like in uh, Cassandra in Greek mythology, she was given the power of prophecy, but cursed so that nobody would believe her. And so I feel there's a lot of Cassandras walking about at the moment. People going, I told you this was going to happen. And nobody listened. Right. So the Stoics say, well, you know, it's all too common that people go, this is unbelievable. But what we should say is there were there are always signs. And we should be asking ourselves why we didn't pay more attention to the signs earlier. That would be a more rational, philosophical way of processing this. Mm. Do we have anything left to learn from Marcus Aurelius? Because there's only a limited amount of information that we've got to go on him. Like, is there a day where all of the insights will be exhausted? Haven't we already reached that? Man, this is a question close to my heart, because I'm in the middle of writing not one but two books about him at the moment, but, which is a thing I'm told doesn't normally happen in publishing. But I'm doing a, a graphic novel at the moment about his life, and then I'm also writing a biography. And I thought, there are like at least half a dozen biographies of Marcus Aurelius. And my, my last book has a lot of biographical stuff, so I thought, do I want to write another biography about Marcus Aurelius? And the strange thing is, yeah, I, immediately I thought, there's loads of things that I still think are worth saying about him. Like, there are people, there are things that people ask me all the time that aren't in How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, and I, I wish I'd had space to address them. And so, and in terms of his life story, you know, I keep coming across new angles and thinking, you know, why is, no, why is nobody ever uh, written about this before? I'll give you a sneak peek, right? Uh, Hadrian had um, the guy that advises us, by the way, there's a Polish guy that advises us on the historical authenticity of the, the stuff that we're writing about for the graphic novel. And uh, he's a big fan of the Frumentarii, who were the secret police in the Roman Empire, strangely. Like, that's his kind of like niche nerdy area. And Hadrian was really into the secret police and the delatores, who are informers. He had spies everywhere because he was super paranoid. And uh, I think no one's ever really written about the fact that Marcus Aurelius probably knew that he was growing up in villas that were full of potential informers and that everybody kind of knew. Epictetus writes about this. He, Epictetus, whose writings Marcus Aurelius was acquainted with, says like, everybody knows that if you slag off Caesar, it will get back to him. And, you know, you could be for the chop. Like, so you have to watch what you say. when Because they had so many servants and slaves in those houses that any of them would potentially go and grass you up and then they'd get, you know, uh, paid a lot of gold for, for doing it. So they really felt they were being watched all the time. And uh, the Historia Augusta says something quite creepy about that. It says Marcus Aurelius was reared under the gaze of Hadrian. Like, so then if you read the meditations, Marcus says in it things like, Never do anything that requires walls or curtains. Now, that suddenly takes on a, a different meaning when you realize that he grew up in this environment surrounded by informals and spies in the service of this crazy, paranoid 
emperor who kept executing potential rivals to the throne. So no one's written about that, though, as far as I'm aware. Now, I think it sheds a light, a connection between the historical events and, and the significance of some of the things that, that Marcus is talking about. Yeah, because you can only see it in that broader context, right? I was, um, I spent my birthday last year on the Stoa Poikle uh, uh-huh. in Athens, uh, which was like... You mean in the bar? Were you, in the, you mean in the, the bar beside it? Or? No, on the steps Nothing. of the painted porch, yeah. No, you, don't, like, no, you mean the Stoa Atalu, the, the one that's like a museum in the Agora? Like, yeah. it's all shiny and new. Yeah, well, is that not on the spot of where the other... Yeah. What, oh, is it not? Are, are you no, going to ruin this for me? Don, that was my birthday. Actually, I wind that back. You were really close, though. You were just across the street from it. Like, that's a, that's a, that's actually kind of a museum. It's the, yeah, yeah. the Stoa of Atlas. Okay. And so it's a replica, right? But it's beautiful. And uh, across the road, there's this dirty hole in the ground full of garbage and graffiti and stuff with some, like, rubble in it and a lot of cats. And that's the Stoa <laughs> Poikile, which ironically... <laughs> used to be this, the original store poke you know it means painted porch like because it was like an art gallery it had these four huge yeah. paintings by the leading artists of the day so that the store is lectured in front of these works of art it would have been as beautiful maybe as the the store that you were on the store uh, the store Atalu. yeah you were on the wrong porch buddy oh, but it was, still, it was a good a, porch a google maps needs uh, it's two it's had two and a half thousand years to get the directions right and obviously google yeah. maps has taken me to the wrong place now i loved it i spent last the birthday before at the Vatican and around the Roman Forum and then the Agora oh. and the Parthenon and everything else this year. I thought just a wonderful, wonderful way to... Uh... That's amazing. Like, I love doing things like that. I feel like I'm very lucky. I like to meet other people that have had a chance to travel. More people should do it because it's not really prohibitively expensive. When the pandemic's over, obviously, it's going to be easier. But I'm in Athens at the moment, so like, I'm just you know down the road from where you were. If it's any consolation, right, the, the, store, the, the place you were basically in the Agora, right, so you were standing on those steps, looking across the place where Socrates used to teach, and also the prison, my good friend, where he was executed. Ah, that is cool. I'll tell you something even cooler about that, right? So one of the things that I think is nerdily cool is most of what we know, well, a lot of what we know about Roman history comes from books, and some of them are unreliable, like they're politically biased or they're just... Even we have evidence in satires, and we're not sure if they're joking or not, right? But what's really weird is sometimes archaeologists will dig something up and think, oh my, like, no way, this kind of confirms something that previously we only knew in writing, right? And they were digging in the Agora, in the, where the prison is, and they found something actually really kind of weird. They found a little statuette of Socrates in the prison building. Now, they may have used this for other things, but typically that would be like in a little shrine or something, like you're honouring a deceased ancestor or something. So they say it kind of looks like the Athenians felt, and they, the Athenians are kind of known for this, right? Like they felt bad about having executed him, and then they thought, oh, we'll put a little shrine up, like, because, you know, like, we actually quite liked him. Like, try and walk so, it back, try and walk the execution yeah, walk back. back again. So like, like you said earlier with the beheading, they were like, well we'll, well, we'll try and fix this by putting a little statue of him in there. Yeah. We love you really, Socrates. Sorry, Socrates. Aurelius was the emperor of Rome, but he was following a Greek-born philosophy. What, yeah, how, it's weird, how come? isn't it? Because the Romans weren't that good at philosophy. Like, they, um, they, they had this thing about loving Greek. They really admired Greek culture. When they conquered Greece, um, they decided that they felt bad about that. I get, like, a lot of ancient history is about people... Regret. <laughs> Yeah, they they totally <laughs> trashed Athens and Greece and destroyed the libraries and things and gutted it. It was sacked by a Roman dictator called Sulla. And then the subsequent generation, exactly like we're saying, felt had a big guilt trip about it. And they they thought, we actually quite like Greek culture. And some people say also they stole all the books and kind of distributed them and sold them. And so people kind of found out a lot about, uh, about Greece because they pillaged it, basically. And uh, and then they started to embrace Greek culture and get more and more into it. And the weird thing was they, they really took to Stoicism um, because Stoics, they thought, were a bit more tough-minded and that kind of resonated with Roman values. They thought of themselves, they liked Greeks, but they thought of Greeks as kind of lightweights and like a bit effete, a bit fancy. And they thought 
we want to like you guys, but if you were a bit tougher like us, and so they were like, oh, the Stoics. There you go. Like, the Stoics are the, the tougher side of Greek culture. So the Romans completely embraced Stoicism. And actually, the guy you mentioned earlier, Augustus, was the founder of the Roman Empire and the first emperor. And we don't know much about this, but cryptically, we know that he had two Stoic tutors. And he wrote a book on philosophy, which is lost now. It's actually an exhortation to philosophy, which is normally like a speech, like a motivational speech, trying to encourage, usually aimed at young men, trying to inspire them to get into philosophy. And uh, so it seems that he kind of dabbled in Stoicism and maybe set a precedent then for mm. later emperors to kind of associate with it. And by the time you get to Marcus Aurelius, you've got the first example of somebody who seems like, uh, what's the expression, you know, like uh, they're just a full-on card-carrying Stoic uh, as emperor. But also Greek, being into Greek culture was trendy at that time. Upon reflecting on all of the different stories about how Zeno of Citium was, he crashed in his ship and then he found himself in a bookstore and all of the different stories that I seem to hear to do with the the way that people began their philosophical journey in, in and around that period, it's so romanticised. Yes, there will probably have been a little bit of artistic licence used, but hearing the way that Marcus Aurelius spoke about himself, the leader of what was essentially the free world, well, it wasn't that free, but the leader of the world uh, at the time, yes. um, hearing the way that he spoke, hearing even stories about Augustus, you know, he was into philosophy, trying to write these, these speeches and treaties to bring young men into philosophy. What's happened between then and any point after then in history, including now, where you what have happened? these philosopher kings. Yeah, I just wonder why it was obviously seen as a competitive advantage to be able uh -huh. to understand yeah. the inner workings of the human mind and what does meaning mean and what is purpose in life, etc. Uh -huh. Why did that stop? Are you asking me, where did it all go wrong? Yes. Yeah, basically. Um, well, okay, this is going to be a controversial one. And actually, historians are a bit unsure about the answer to that. But the traditional answer that people tend to give is that Christianity supplanted Greek philosophy. And, you know, this is debated by some people, but, you know, conventionally people will say, well, the Christians closed the Greek philosophical schools and banned teaching a philosophy, and, uh, and Christianity became dominant, and uh, it was uh, in some ways antagonistic to a lot of the learning that had accumulated up until that point. Now, on the other hand, uh, Christianity, to me in, anyway, looks really super stoic. Like Christianity, there are many um, kind of passing allusions to stoicism in the New Testament. And several of the church fathers we know tr studied stoicism before they became Christians. St. Augustine, Tertullian, some of the Gnostics were, were into stoicism. And, the, you know, early Christians in general they saw the Stoics as being like the closest thing in pagan philosophy to Christianity. I'll give you a good example of that. You know Dante's um, Divine Comedy, in the second book of it, in the Purgatory, um, the person who's guarding the gates of Purgatory is a famous Stoic called Cato the Younger or Cato of Utica. And so Dante's basically saying, like, if it wasn't for the fact that you don't believe in Jesus, like, buddy, you would be, like, basically a saint. Like you are like the, you're basically a pagan saint. Like you're the close you're as close to the gates of heaven as you can you can basically get. And that was how he sort of portrayed Cato. Um, this kind of like uh, you know as as a Stoic who was kind of as close as pagan culture got to Christianity. And people have said many Christians have said that about Marcus Aurelius. They read the Meditations and thought this sounds kind of Christian in places. There's a bit in it where he even says you should love your enemies and things like that. Like I mean that sounds like the New Testament. Also a bit of trivia for you. Um, the Stoics are actually mentioned in the New Testament. Not a lot of people know that. In the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, St. Paul goes to the Areopagus, which is just near where you were. You went to the Acropolis, right? Like, there's a big rock covered in broken beer bottles and graffiti, anarchy symbols, at the bottom of the Acropolis called the Areopagus, the, the, like the, the rock of Mars, where they used to give um, speeches and things. And St. Paul goes there and gave a famous sermon to a bunch of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And he quotes a, a Stoic poet to them called 
Aratus. So the, the Stoics were kind of connected to Christianity and they influenced Christianity. The, especially the, this idea of brotherly love that you get in Christianity, the, the main precedent for that in uh, Hellenistic culture is in, in Stoic philosophy. People hearing Christians say that would be like, that sounds like Stoicism. And I think if you read Marcus Aurelius, you can see he talks a lot about you know, brotherly love and natural affection and cosmopolitanism and yada, yada. That's why people read it and think there's something Christian about this. Mm. I'm currently halfway through The Immortality Key by Brian Murarescu. Do you, have, you, have you read this? I haven't read that. So, I don't know of it, actually. What's it like? He has, it's part of the um, psychoactive pagan uh, conversion theory theory i can't remember the full the full theory of it i need to get it before but it's all about is it El- eleusis yeah eleusis yeah and the cucreon um which was this uh the priestesses at the time used to give these particular drinks and have these rituals yeah. and his argument is that it was a psychoactive ergot. substance yeah. yeah yeah the ergot that was in the grain um and yeah. it's an entire book it's huge it's like 400 really? yeah 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 the immortality key brian you should about the idea yeah, it's I should check that out. Very, very well done. Um, right, enough, enough learning about the the actual history. What did the Stoics say about finding purpose in life? People need that that anomie at the moment. What do they say it's about good, finding purpose? It's a, it's a good thing, and we should all do that. But the the, the Stoics are like the the great grandchildren of Socrates, right? I see them as all being part of the same Socratic Stoic tradition, essentially. Um, there's one author, the ancient author, that says the, Sto- the Stoics are a Socratic sect. So this aspect really lines up with Socrates, right? So Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living, which is pretty hardcore. Like he said, you know, life is all about finding your values. He calls it the the uh, finding questioning the most important things in life. He calls it. So we would say your values, or they also call it the arete, the virtues. Um, so Socrates uh, spent his whole life interrogating people about what's the meaning of justice, what's the meaning of courage, you know, what's the nature of the good, what's the nature of virtue. And he said, you know, he wanted to do that in the afterlife, his trial. And he said if they told him they would release him and send him into exile, but he would maybe be executed or tried in another city if he didn't keep his gob shut and he kept on asking questions about these things, he, he said, you, I wouldn't be able to stop. Like, there's no point doing sending me into exile. He goes, because I'm just going to carry on doing it. Like, that's what he says in court and Plato's apology, which is totally unapologetic, ironically. So, yeah, like he not only does he say it's a good thing, he says it's actually the meaning of life is to question your values and explore them really deeply. And, you know, that's why... Socrates thought that wisdom was virtually unattainable. And so he insisted on calling himself not a sophistes, not a wise man, like the other gurus around did, but he called himself philosophos, like a lover of wisdom or a friend of wisdom. And the connotation of that, Plato makes really clear, is that Socrates said, I don't have wisdom, but I have the next best thing, which is a love, respect, and admiration of wisdom. Like, so somebody who genuinely, from the bottom of their heart, aspires to wisdom is almost as good as somebody who actually is wise. Like, you know, they're almost as admirable. Like, they're a seeker after truth and they're on the right path. Like, their heart's in the right place kind of thing. And Socrates wants to say, like, that that's the meaning of life, right? Nobody's perfect. Nobody's wise. But to feel the kind of pain, in a way, of lacking wisdom, like, and to crave it, like, and to realize it's the most important thing in life... And to dedicate your life to this kind of endless journey like, is really what life is actually all about. You know, it's more about the journey than the destination, in a sense, for Socrates. It's about the method of Socratic questioning. And so we, like you, we were saying earlier, we live in a very unquestioning society. Now, I'm, I want to emphasize that because if you go on the Internet, you'll find it's full of self-help books and articles. But I think there's something deeply ironic about this. Because although everywhere we go, we're surrounded by self-help advice, I still feel there's a massive lack of reflection in modern society. And sometimes I think people are using self-help actually as an avoidance strategy, like a way of that. I'm very attuned to this from being a cognitive therapist, because any decent modern cognitive therapist, probably any modern psychotherapist should tell you the first thing a psychotherapist normally ends up doing especially these days, I think more over time, in their initial assessment session, 
is asking clients what existing self-help or therapy strategies they use and often getting them to stop doing a lot of them. Like, because many of the strategies people use are actually counterproductive, we now realise. And, and, you know, there's a lot of bad self-help and psychological advice that, that circulates on, on the internet. So although people talk about self-help and they're kind of fascinated by it in our society, it's like a huge thing. Like, at, I'll go, and I'll give you a really clear example of that. It's my favourite subject right now. It's super topical. Anger, right? Hardly anybody is really bothered to talk about and do anything about anger, in themselves and in society. The people that talk about self-help are more likely to be talking about personal suffering, like anxiety and depression, but they're seldom really addressing feelings of anger. There are psychological reasons for that. Um, We know that to be the case. I think anger is the royal road to self-improvement though. I think people are really missing a trick there. I think it's much easier in some ways to address anger first. Like, and there's a huge potential there for self-improvement if we could just kind of, as a society, encourage people to question their anger more. And the Stoics thought anger was the main thing we should be working on precisely because they said, you know, it's the, the emotion that's most obviously a threat to society. Uh, it's the most interpersonal emotion in a sense. So I really, that's kind of one of my passions at the moment. Uh, and I use that word advisedly is that uh, we need to get people to kind of really do self-help more on anger why it's a massive gap that's interesting i for better or for worse anger is an emotion that for me is very 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 rare i think i'm fairly cognizant at, at knowing what's going on the texture of my own mind is something i'm not totally ignorant to um and yet over um the last month or so there was a period where i got angry and oh my god it is such a hell of an emotion, especially when you're not necessarily attuned to it. There's other uh-huh. things that occur more frequently in my life. And it's like the devil that you know. You you understand, okay, we're at this stage, we're at that stage, and you almost get into the rhythm of understanding how you deal with it. But anger is so all-encompassing. And when you then scale that up into crowds, these crowds can be virtual online in a group, in yeah. a, a Reddit thread on a QAnon sub, sub forum or whatever it might be, or they can be in person at a football riot or at the, the Capitol Hill. It can cause that. Um, I, I want to loop back to something you mentioned as well about how – People are using personal development to almost stave off the different fears that they have. And I'm 100% in agreement. I've had this theory for a long time that the current longevity, biohacking, productivity movements, time management, all of these things are working on Ernest Becker's denial of death. That people terrified about the fact that lives don't have any greater yeah. meaning. We've removed our connection to the wider world, to nature, to the awe of the night sky. And what are they doing? Oh, if I live longer, if I get more done in less time, then I won't have this fear anymore. I can give you a long list of reasons why self-help is an avoidance strategy. Why uh, many, many reasons. Uh, here's number one: clients come into therapy. They'll usually go, I've got this huge library of self-help books that I've been reading for years, right? So a lot of self-help reading just encourages what we call ruminative thinking. So people are thinking about their problems and chewing them over, not actually doing anything to change them. A lot of self-help strategies involve emotional control or suppression, like so using breathing techniques, visualization techniques, mantras and things are ways that people use to actually avoid engaging with their emotions and processing them naturally. Um, people use self-help as a way of getting direction from authority figures like psychologists rather than becoming more self-reliant to identify their own values. Well, there are many ways that, that people use self-help uh, advice in a, a way that's obviously counterproductive. And the clients in therapy will tell you that themselves. Like It's very common clients come into therapy and they say, you know, I read all these articles and I've got this massive library of self-help books, but I'm not getting any better. and uh, you know there are reasons for that i was having a look at objective representation and cognitive distancing uh when reading your book and how does that relate to the stoic work and and what is it and how can people utilize it fantasia cataleptica is the the greek um and it it's hard to translate but it it, it actually means a, a an impression or a representation that grasps reality as grounded in reality and what the stoics appear to mean by this so objective representation is pierre hedo's kind of paraphrase of that and it it means describing events in a way that suspends value judgments or emotive rhetoric right 
I was going to say a minute ago, actually, if you want to experience anger, like you were saying, you know, just go on the, the comments on YouTube or something like that for five minutes. And, you know, it's like a laboratory experiment in anger exposure. Like, it's hard. And even if you don't have anger, you've got to deal with other people's, right? But the internet is full of people using strongly emotive language. Um, like, you know, rather than saying, people will say things like, you know, you shot me down in flames and tore a strip off me when they could say, oh, you just expressed disagreement with part of what I said. Like, so the Stoics one is, this is why Cicero thought the Stoics were rubbish at legal rhetoric. Like, he was like, you guys... Oh, there was no need- drama. There was no, yeah. there, was, there was no showmanship with it. Yeah. He goes, you make everything too concise and too kind of banal. And they were like, well, th- like, that's to get rid of the effect of rhetoric, right? Like, you know, like, sure, in a law court, you're trying to manipulate the audience. We're trying to undo that. I call stoicism kind of anti-rhetoric or counter-rhetoric. And, you know, in the ancient world, there were these lawyers stroke self-help gurus called the sophists. And I used to, for a long time, think we don't really have sophists in the modern world. Maybe we have, like, self-help gurus and stuff, but it's not quite the same. And then one day it dawned on me. Like we do, we have digital sophists. Like Facebook is basically a massive sophist, and so is Twitter. So that the sophists would just say whatever would get a reaction out of people. Like, and Socrates was like, "This is a problem, man. You guys are just saying whatever you know evokes anger or what like, gets the crowd, the crowd to applaud you or whatever, and you don't really give two hoots about the truth." Like, you're just saying whatever gets a response from people, and that just leads to distortion. It amplifies people's emotions. And it, one day it dawned on me, I thought, yeah, we don't have sophists like that anymore because now they've been taken over by algorithms. That's basically what social media, the social media is, it's just massive sophist. And so we need Socrates and we need the Stoics to teach us this, how to protect ourselves against sophistry and rhetoric and the manipulation of our emotions through the use of emotive language. So Stoics say we should learn to re-describe things in a more down-to-earth and objective way so that we can stick to the facts like, and not distort things in, in, kind of, like, in a way that fires our emotions up. How can people apply that cognitive distancing? Obviously, it sounds great. How do they do it? The Stoics just want us to practice. Like, when we're, we feel that we're getting upset or angry about something, first of all, like, they want us just to pause and maybe to say to ourselves, it's not things that upset us, but rather our opinions about them. So realizing that it's our way of thinking that's causing us to, to feel so upset rather than the event itself. Take responsibility, basically, for our value judgments. And then to re-describe it, to say, well, like, what, what's actually happening here in more specific down-to-earth and objective language? And when we do that, the Stoics think that helps us to moderate the the effect of our emotions. And then the other thing is to broaden our perspective because, I mean, the Stoics were way ahead of their time, right? And if you think the Stoics were ahead of their time, my friend, like, you want to go and read some Sigmund Freud, like, because that wasn't that long ago. And people people still use Freud today, right? Even though that would be like alchemy or something, like, you know, that, like, Freud was pre-scientific psychology, right? So I remember when I started as a psychotherapist, psychoanalytic approaches were still kind of not that rare. You know, people still took them quite seriously. Um, Largely Freudianism in its traditional form has kind of died off now. But if you compare what he was doing to what the the Stoics were doing, they were way ahead of their time. Like the Stoics seemed futuristic compared to Freud. Like Freud had no idea really what he was talking about. Um, and you know, most of regard contrary, people are going to be shocked if I say this, but I I think there's very little of value in Freud's writings. And I have a master's degree in psychoanalytic theory. Incidentally, I trained as a psychoanalytic counselor, um, and I had psychoanalysis myself. Uh, it's in just was it not just like, projection? Was it not just an entire well, lifetime of internal projection? Yeah, Freud. Um, I'm very interested in Freud's biography, actually. Freud's father died, and then he had a lot of dreams about it that were traumatic for him, and he decided to interpret his own dreams, and he he believed that he unconsciously was attracted sexually to his own mother um, and frightened of his father, uh, and there was this kind of love triangle. And then he just assumed that that applied to everybody else, which is obviously crazy. 
Right, because he'd hardly seen any clients. He'd seen about five or six clients, I think, by the time he'd already decided that this was true of everyone. And Freud hated therapy. Like, he, he really didn't like doing it. If you look at his collected writings, you know, there's whatever, 12 volumes or something. I think there's only one volume actually about therapy. And the rest of it's all this crazy theory and him doing psychoanalysis and Leonardo da Vinci and Moses and like weird speculative anthropology and stuff. He, he just wanted to be a kind of armchair like uh, you know theorist or whatever really is, is that not the the biggest distinction between what he did and what the stoics did that it was a philosophy of action born in the crucible of real life yeah and stoicism lasted a lot longer i mean freudian psychoanalysis was trendy for like i don't know like 60 years or 70 years or whatever and then it's, it's pretty much dead in the water you know it's, it's like they like, it's like a few of the bit like alchemy now or something um but stoicism flourished in the ancient world for five centuries like, and that meant, you know, but to Marcus Aurelius, Socrates was ancient history. Like, Socrates died uh, 500 years before uh, before Marcus Aurelius um, was even born. And, uh, you know, that would be as, like, like I was talking about somebody in the late medieval period, right? So they're like, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, and so a lot of people in Greece and Rome and all over the, the known world have been practicing Stoicism. We know of 80 uh, Stoic philosophers from antiquity, uh, the names of authors or teachers. Like, there were loads of them. Um, so like it was something that they developed over a very long period of time. And I, I'm still puzzled by it and impressed by it, like how much of it is is relevant and is confirmed by modern research and psychology. So the, what, the one I was going to mention is we know... Now that when people get angry or depressed, they, they, there's a narrowing in the scope of attention. So people can normally pay attention to like maybe five or six things at once. So you could be driving your car and listening to the radio and, and maybe thinking about what you're going to have for dinner and also kind of like telling your kids in the back seat to keep the noise down or whatever, right? So you can walk and chew gum. Like you can do more than one thing at a time. You can multitask or whatever, except when you're under stress. Like so, when people like become very emotionally distressed, their scope of attention narrows, and they're less capable to think about multiple things at once, right? And we do this thing called threat monitoring, where we tend to really zero in, put under a magnifying glass that the things that we see as threatening or upsetting. And the Stoics realized that we did that. Like Freud has no concept really that's equivalent to this. He thinks. What you should really be doing is trying to figure out whether it symbolizes castration in your dreams or something like that, <laughs> like which nobody nobody thinks is helpful. Sigmund, today. for the love of God, <laughs> leave it alone. Freud literally thought, like Freud literally thought, all he says all forms of anxiety are disguised castration anxiety, like all forms of anxiety, like that's how crazy Freud's theory was. Anyway, they. Um, the Stoics were like, no, like, I mean, anxiety is caused by your value judgments, like you'd think, like most people might assume, right? So if you think something is really, really bad and it's about to happen, then you're probably going to feel anxious, right? Because it's got to do with the value that you invest in external events, uh, especially if they're, you know, they're not directly under your control. It's going to feel more anxiety provoking. That, that's common sense in a way. And so the Stoics think also we narrow our attention down onto things and they realize if you broaden the scope of your attention, It'll tend to dilute the emotional response. So you might have said something that annoys me on Twitter, right? And maybe I don't know anything about you and I haven't seen what your day's been like. All I know is that you just said something that could be taken in a slightly offensive way. Like, so now taking that one remark in isolation, I'm going to focus my attention narrowly on it and have this kind of intense emotional reaction to it. Whereas if I broadened my attention, like I might, you know, if I did know more about you, I might think, oh, maybe you do a lot of good things. You know, maybe you've had a bad day. Like, you know, maybe you gave money to charity yesterday. Like, so there would be a more rounded picture of you. That's really one of the things that's lacking in modern society. We react to these little slices of people's character or behavior rather than viewing their personality in a rounded way. Socrates talks about this problem explicitly. Um, actually in relation to his own wife, Xanthope. So people say, oh my God, how can you stand to live with that woman? Because she had a notoriously bad temper, right? And Socrates was like, but she's a really good wife and a good mother. She just shouts at me occasionally. Yes, she threw a bucket of water over me once, but like I try and interpret her behavior in a round. And she's also like a really awesome person. 
Why? So Socrates has this whole dialogue about it, where he says, you know, you've got to view people, you've got to go past the appearance and get to the reality. And that means like focusing in a more broad way on somebody's character as a whole. And we don't do that today. We narrow our attention down. Social media, by its very nature, potentially encourages us to do that because it speeds up communication by abstracting little pieces of information out. But that prevents us really from getting to know people properly. And, you know, to, to understand all this, to forgive all the saying goes, well, you know, I don't know if we could take that literally, but certainly the more we know about people, the less likely we are to have knee-jerk emotional responses to the, the things that we do, especially if we make an effort like to maintain that rounded perspective on things. Because on the one hand, I can see the nasty thing that you said, and I have uh, maybe I still have an emotional reaction to that, but when my attention is broadened, I'm also seeing and remembering other nice things that you did, and so that compensates or it balances it out. So I can still disapprove of the thing that you did, but not be completely emotionally overwhelmed by it, because I'm adopting a more balanced perspective. What would Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics have to say about facing adversity? They think it's a good thing, like, which seems like a truism, but there were other people that thought it was a bad thing. Like, there were other philosophers in the ancient world that thought you'd be better off going and living in a commune and avoiding... Co like, allegedly, Epicureans will get upset if I say this because there's some disagreement about it. But in the ancient world, people thought the Stoics and the Epicureans were almost polar opposites. And Epicurus lived in this little private garden on the uh, outside uh, Athens, uh, surrounded by a circle of his friends in relative obscurity. And allegedly, he said, it's better not to marry or have children or get involved in public life. Like, you know, basically live like a monk or live like a, on a hippie commune or whatever, like all peace and love and, and try and keep it tranquil. Like, whereas the Stoics wanted to get right in the middle of the fray, like, they were where you were, right, in the Agora. Like, you know, just like, you know, the, the Stoicoikoli faced the Agora. Same as Socrates would go and do philosophy in the street and at his friends' houses. And so the, so the downside of that is that people would be really abusive to them. People um, used to beat Socrates up in the street. Like, they'd threaten him, they'd shout abuse at him because he was asking too many questions and rocking the boat. But Socrates was famous for apatheia, like, which is, you know, a term that we use in Stoic philosophy. We're told that it was really Socrates that made this concept famous. He was unruffled. He was as cool as a cucumber and as unruffled as a tortoise. It's like, that's pretty unruffled. Like, he wouldn't let anything. But have you ever seen a tortoise that looked ruffled? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> exactly, right? So that's uh, Socrates. He wasn't easily phased. But the thing... When we talk about temperance and self-control in ancient philosophy, like one of the most obvious ways that's manifested is in being able to have conversations without losing your temper. And Socrates was famous for that. Epictetus, the Stoic teacher, loves Socrates, goes on and on and on about him. He tells his students that they should emulate Socrates. But then he says something really weird that I think should freak out modern readers of Plato. He says, you know, the most important thing that you could learn from Socrates is that he never got in quarrels. It wasn't even the things he said. It was the way that he said them. It was the fact that he was always good-humoured and artfully polite. And even when people got angry with him, like, he was able to defuse it. Like, and he never, ever lost his temper with other people. Like, so talking to people about really sensitive subjects, like religion and politics and stuff like that, you know, often it just degenerates. You see it all the time on the internet. But Socrates didn't avoid these discussions, and he also didn't let them spiral out of control. So he, his adversity was facing argumentative people, bad-tempered people. Now, in the end, he did get executed, partly for that, and, and for other things that he did along the way, right? But throughout his life, he was known for this magical ability, this paranormal ability, to be able to talk to people about really sensitive subjects and interrogate them about it, and for them for the most part, not to punch him in the face. What if the adversity isn't so easily cerebrally sort of explained away? It's not just the sort of thing that you can have a discourse about. For example? A pandemic. Oh, the pandemic. I mean, funnily enough, Socrates lived through a, a, a plague and Marcus Aurelius, you, you know, lived through the, the Antonine Plague. Um, I mean, you know, like books and stoicism have shot through the roof in terms of sales, 
since the beginning of the pandemic. So I think instinctively, a lot of people have felt that stoicism could help them deal with the adversity of the pandemic. Not just because of the historical connection, but they kind of have this visceral feeling that Stoicism is relevant to dealing with this situation. The, the ancient Stoics write a lot about how to cope with being sent into exile. And I used to think, that doesn't seem that relevant to me in my life. And then the pandemic happened. Like, and we had quarantining and all that. And I thought, all that stuff I read in Seneca about exile suddenly seems really relevant now. <laughs> it's basically the same thing. Like, I mean, I wasn't sent into exile by the Emperor Nero or whatever, but like, I might as well have been, you know, like, I'm not allowed to leave my house except to go for groceries. Like, and uh, I think it, it suddenly seems relevant to people. But I, I don't, I feel like I almost don't need to persuade people of that because it seems like everyone's figured that out for themselves. They're all reading the Stoics since the beginning of the pandemic. I think a big, there are many aspects that are relevant. And one of them is, um, I think, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this, but well, there's a couple of things. First of all, a lot of people have had to simplify their lifestyle during lockdown and so on. I feel like when, you know, there are several ways in which we're not going back to normal after this. Uh, you never go back. Like So after this pandemic ends, I wonder how many people are going to think, I, maybe I don't need to go back to eating out in expensive restaurants all the time. Like, you know, the amount, the amount of money that people blew on entertainment in the city where I lived in Toronto, that's, you know, it's full of expensive bars and restaurants. Well, you and won't, you may not know this, but my industry of 14 years, I've been a club promoter, one of the biggest yeah. in the UK. Um, and this is something that I am, I'm concerned about for our industry. People used to go out to the same venue on the same night of the week and then a different venue on a different night yeah. of the week every single week. And that's where we made our money. It's not so good for you. Like maybe it's, bit, but it's kind of also breaking that. It's a habit, right? For a lot of people, correct. Right? It's just what they 100% do. They get correct. get a bit agitated if it gets to Friday night or whatever, and they're like they're stuck at home. We start pacing up and down. Like, but uh, once the habit's broken, like after a few months, they might think, "But well, like, do I need to go out as often?" I mean, it might not take some people that long to get back into it, but I think some people like will reevaluate their expenditure and reevaluate the lifestyle. I mean, I've spoken, you must have met a lot of people who everyone's changed their daily routine. So a lot of people are suddenly doing yoga and going for walks in the park and all that. And I think a lot of people might think maybe I'll carry on doing yoga and going for walks in the park, even after the, the pandemic's finished, you know, because maybe they, they've realized that it's healthier than what they were doing before. And maybe they're actually, a lot of people are happier. Not everyone. Some people are really struggling psychologically. But a lot of people actually feel that they're better off. Like it's, you know, it's improved their mental health having to deal with the lockdown. And again, one of the paradoxical aspects of that is coming to terms with your own mortality. You know, the thing that, again, isn't really talked about that much in self-help, art, life hack articles and uh, whatnot. Um, I wrote an article about this recently where I thought I'm going to do the opposite and just really get into the guts of this whole everyone's going to die thing. Like, because I, I really believe it's, it's liberating. When I was a young guy, I was quite reckless. And, uh, you know, a couple of times I, I got into situations where I thought, oh, geez, maybe my, my time's up. This is it, buddy. Um, you know, just because I did stupid things when I was a teenager. And then, you know, maybe people have health scares and stuff. I gave a talk once when I asked, how many people in the audience, put your hand up, have ever had a brush with death, either through health scare or a dangerous situation? I think it was about two thirds of the audience. Like, it's kind of surprised me. And I said, was it what you thought it was going to be like? Like, were you scared? And a lot of people, they had a bit of a chat about it. And what, what emerged was a lot of people said, well, in, a, in an emergency, often you don't really have time to feel scared. You, you're more just kind of like focused on getting out of there or, or dealing with a situation or whatever. And sometimes you feel incredibly calm when you, you think, like, maybe this is a, it's not what people imagine it to be necessarily. Now, I think it's different for everyone. But um, for me, also being bereaved and losing someone close to you can have a similar effect, I think, of making you reappraise your values and think, look back on you, because it makes you look at your life if you have time, like, and, and think, oh, geez, you know, like, was it worth it? Like, you know, if, if, I, if, I, if I dodge this bullet and I get another chance, should I go right back on Facebook or watch another season of Friends or whatever? Like, and so it makes you really think those things I was doing, well, they just like ways of killing time. 
or were they actually kind of meaningful and fulfilling things? One of the things we learned from modern psychotherapy, evidence-based psychotherapy, cutting edge of evidence-based psychotherapy for clinical depression, we used to think uh, people with clinical depression weren't doing enough enjoyable things. So Aaron Beck, the founder of Cognitive Therapy, his big innovation was, uh, part of it was to uh, do activity scheduling and get people to do more pleasurable activities during the day. Actually, like he didn't invent that technique. It was a guy called Peter Lewinson that doesn't get credit for it, that, that invented that technique. But Beck was wrong anyway. So we, we now know that that's slightly off. It's not pleasurable activities that, that help people with depression. It's meaningful activities. Like there's a subtle difference between something that makes you feel happy, like it gives you a kind of warm glow, and something that actually makes you feel fulfilled in a deeper sense, right? So maybe eating a chocolate, you know, or having sex or watching a, a comedy kind of makes you feel good, but like it's not necessarily going to make you a more fulfilled person in the long term, like if the rest of your life is kind of pointless. Why, and you don't feel that you've got any direction. And so what really seems to emerge pretty quickly, just once you start asking people the right questions, is that, again, where we started, buddy, is people don't know what their values are. And so if you don't know what your real values are in life, then how do you know what it is that you should be doing all day long every day? And, you know, a sudden brush with the Grim Reaper might be what it takes, like, for people to suddenly think, maybe I need to figure out what I actually value in life what you know no one has ever had on their tombstone engraved i wish i'd spent more time on facebook or i wish i'd watched more netflix right so i think the pandemic has forced a lot of people to have that existential crisis and uh, reappraise their values and you know we need to i think we need to push people further in that direction you know to question those values and then start actually putting them into practice more and then maybe we wouldn't have as many riots and stuff one of my favorite passages, in fact, probably my favorite passage from the entire book. I'm just going to read it out here. Looking back, it seems more obvious to me now than ever before that the lives of most men are tragedies of their own making. Men let themselves either get puffed up with pride or tormented by grievances. Everything they concern themselves with is fragile, trivial, and fleeting. We're left with nowhere to stand firm amidst the torrent of things rushing past. There's nothing secure in which we can invest our hopes. What's that mean? exactly what we've been talking about like when you do um behavioral analysis with clinically depressed clients what emerges from it is a lot of the things the more depressed someone is the more time they're going to spend doing avoidant behaviors so if you say what did you do all day yesterday it, often it's mainly things that just help them to avoid feelings of boredom feelings of anxiety like i drank i took drugs scrolled like, through my phone masturbated like slept you know like why did you you know like did, did those things kind of like really make you feel like a more fulfilled individual or no i just felt like i needed to do something i was starting to feel bored feeling agitated so i mean a life that's driven by avoidance and doing things in order to avoid feelings is never going to really be a healthy or, or satisfying life they're, they're sort of away from goals I'm doing this in order to get away from unpleasant feelings. Whereas what you really want are towards goals. I'm doing it because I really love this thing. I, you know, I love learning. I love wisdom. I love creativity. You know, I want to do more of that stuff. I'll tell you one of the scary things. Like whenever we do values clarification with people, which is something that therapists have been doing since the 70s, and it's 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 quite one of the parts of therapy that's most influenced by Socrates. So we get someone to identify their values, let's say, uh, with a bit of work, a bit of effort. And then we might say, well, OK, let's say yesterday, roughly how much time did you spend doing stuff that's consistent with your values? And the most common answer, we're saying how many minutes or hours? The most common answer I hear from people is zero. Right. And that at first, that really shocked me. I thought they're going to say maybe half the time or a few hours. No, it's usually zero. Zero. Like I spent zero minutes all week doing anything that I thought was of any intrinsic value. Like, over and over again. It's crazy, isn't it? Embarrassingly, well, not embarrassingly, but I it took me 31 years until the beginning of last year for me to ever work out my core values. 
Uh-huh. And upon reading that quote uh, about how amidst the torrent of things rushing past, there's nothing secure in which we can invest our hopes, that passage to me is talking about someone who is living an unintentional life. They haven't consciously reflected on what it is that they want to want in life, and they're just blown along by societal norms and genetic predisposition yeah. and paths of least resistance and the way they're dealt with past traumas, all that stuff. Mm. And it is only upon the time that we sit back, we give ourselves that mindfulness gap and we think, okay, what do I want to want? What are the things that I hold so dear that I'm prepared to sacrifice yeah. the things that are easy in order to get them? The Cynic and Stoic philosophers who have a name for it. They call it T-Force or Two-Force, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It means like smoke or mist, um, like uh, Maya, like the veil of illusion, except they think it comes from people's opinions. So it's like the prevailing values of society. They say it's all smoke and mirrors. Like, so that we live in this world where we come in, we're thrown into the world as babies. Like, we grow up, we look around, we copy the adults around us. We don't know what we're supposed to be doing. We're like a blank slate in a sense. And we see everyone else running around like crazy, uh, trying to maintain their reputation and accumulate wealth and property. So we're growing up, inevitably we think, I guess that's what you're supposed to do. Like, I guess we're meant to try and get a better car than other people and, like, you know, get the best job. And it's really awful if you if you, if you you don't get a promotion and pass all your exams and stuff like that. And so we get indoctrinated generation after generation after generation since the dawn of history into pursuing external extrinsic goals. Because maybe because the very, very ways that our society and our brains are built and the way our language works. And then it, maybe we get a shock, a brush with death or a bereavement or something makes us think more deeply. Um, and we start to think, is this really making me happy? Maybe maybe it's all BS. Like, maybe, maybe it doesn't really make you happy. Like, And the pandemic, maybe for some people, it's got like, maybe my job wasn't making me happy. Do you know, as a therapist, one of the main adversities that I deal with, two of the main ones are relationship breakups and redundancy, Right. And, you know, of course, it seems like a trauma to many people that their marriage ends or their relationship ends or they get sacked or made redundant or whatever. But very often, like six months later, it might turn out to be for the best. Like maybe they've gone on to a better relationship or a better. There are many people that leave their jobs like in middle age, let's say, and then go on to do something that they actually want to do. Like, it's the, you know, maybe the worst thing that can happen to somebody in life is that they never lose their job. Like, you know, because then maybe they're stuck doing whatever it was that they just happened to stumble into doing in life. I think there are many people that are just doing a job that they, you know, that they ended up doing because it was convenient. and But maybe it's not fulfilling to them. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently is the term it was meant to be when used retrospectively. So a lot of the time, a situation will occur, perhaps an adversity or perhaps even a good thing or whatever it might be. And then out the back of that, however many weeks or months later, someone says, well, it was meant to be because look at where I am now. And to me, Mm -hmm. with my particular metaphysical view of the world, that seems to rob all of the beauty and agency from how that person's dealt with the situation. How about the causation runs in the opposite direction that a thing happened and you made it work? that you lost your job, had a bereavement, broke up with your partner, and the outcome of that, you were so capable, you had so much upward mobility that you made, you wrangled the world into the outcome that you wanted. It wasn't meant to be. You made it be. Yeah. I mean, the Stoics, you mentioned facing adversity earlier, which is really what this is all about. Yeah, the Stoics think by nature, we kind of avoid adversity, um, but they think the paradox is we should undertake voluntary hardship. Like we should go out of our comfort zone and seek out challenges because we're probably better at coping in a sense than, than we assume. We're survivors, generally speaking. The Stoics think we have to be careful. This is something that people miss about Stoicism. When we face adversity, we've got to judge whether we're going to be overwhelmed by it or whether. It, and the analogy we'd be choosing like a sparring partner um, in ancient wrestling or in a martial art. So you don't pick someone who's really easy and not a challenge, but you don't pick some guy that's twice the size of you who's just going to flatten you into a pulp, right? (laughs) So obviously you can engage it and you pick something that's going to be challenging but not overwhelming. 
And so that's what the Stoics have to say about adversity. Epictetus pretty much says exactly that to his students. Um, he says, you'll only know from your own experience what you can actually handle, like, but you should always be kind of pushing yourself to take on challenges so that you can you know, trust in your coping ability and strengthen your coping ability, but obviously don't bite off more than you can chew. Um, I, you know, I, I think people are too timid in a sense. Um, Epictetus also said to his students, they love Hercules. Um, Hercules is the favorite demigod or, or god um, of the Stoics in Greek mythology. And uh, they love the, the myth of the, the 12 labors of Hercules. And Epictetus says to his students, but you guys are always telling me how you're kind of like trying to avoid problems in life and stuff. He said, let me ask you a question. If Hercules had lain in bed under the covers and been attended on by other men, and he'd never wandered the earth in poverty, persecuted by other people, facing one monster after another. Like, do you honestly think that you would still admire him? He wouldn't even be worthy of the name Hercules, he says. So the only reason that you admire him is because he got hammered, like, with adversity, like, and he stood up to it through self-discipline and courage, like, he persevered. Like he had one of the, the idea of the twelve labors is that Hercules had like the toughest life ever. Like he was constantly kind of battling and struggling. He was per, he was being persecuted by the goddess Hera. Like so, he made enemies in in high places, as it were. And so that's what he kind of represents. Um, Sepictetus said, "Sure, like, but you guys think the opposite. You you know you just want to avoid trouble, like, and have an easy life. But then you'll die, like, you'll be on your deathbed and you'll look back at it." And you'll think, Jesus, I spent a lot of time in bed, just kind of like <laughs> watching TV and stuff. Like, you know, trust me, when you know, when your time's up and you look back, you know, it's all the kind of challenges that you faced and that you overcame are the things that you're most likely to have some kind of sense of satisfaction from. You know, it's the times when you pushed yourself and went out of your comfort zone, like that makes your life meaningful. Um, you know, you won't even remember. I challenge you to remember what happens in most of the episodes of Friends or whatever, you know. Like, uh, the amount of TV that people watch in our society, you think about how much of it can they actually remember. Like, so then what was the point of it? It was just a way of killing time. As Marcus Aurelius says, quoting Heraclitus, you know, we, we are, we're like men asleep, like in a, a dream or something like that, you know, walking about in a trance. And the Stoics want us to snap out of that, you know, to wake up. Like, contemplation of death is one way of doing that. But really, it's kind of existential crisis there. They want to evoke in us, like, to, to, you know, really rethink everything dramatically, to turn our life upside down. The cynics used to symbolize that by walking backwards. Um, it always reminds me, you know that video with the Verve, with Richard Ash Ashcroft or whatever his name is? He's putting he's the jacket the on. And, yeah, he's yeah, bumping yeah. into all these people and all that. That's, he's, a, he's a cynic philosopher, buddy. Like, that's exactly what they did, right? And uh, they'd wait until everybody was coming out of the theater and then walk into the crowd and bump into them all. And people would say to Diogenes, why are you doing that? You're, like, You're going the wrong way. And uh, he'd say, I'm just practicing for something that I do my whole life long while I am training myself. He goes, because I'm swimming against the current funnily, existentially throughout my whole life. You know, I'm going against the prevailing values of Athenian society, you know, and you've got to toughen yourself up to do that. People are going to laugh at me, like, tell me I'm, I'm doing everything back to front. Like, but when you're surrounded by smoke and mirrors, like, and all the BS of society and hedonism, narcissism, celebrity culture, consumerism, Santa Claus, you know, all that Coca-Cola like you know all that kind of stuff like people are going to think you're crazy if you reject it like try and rise above it and the cynics were like you're going to have to practice what they called shamelessness or we call it we do a similar thing in therapy today we call it shame attacking to toughen up like so you don't really care if everybody laughs at you um because you're going to have to be laughed at if you're going to you know strike out on your own and uh, you know have the courage to do things differently is that an inevitability now, even in the modern world? Because I think it's easy to hear about these ancient times and think, yeah, yeah, but that were, you know, they were they were totally uncivilized and they were th these sort of ridiculous <clears throat> individuals. And maybe there's a little bit of drama and artistic license being used. 
and we presume that because it's so such a civilized civilization now that we shouldn't be being ostracized for the things that we say we shouldn't be being out on a limb we shouldn't be going into exile and walking backwards outside of the theater it sounds like it sounds ridiculous now is that still the case for someone who wants the consciously designed life is that an inevitable price to pay yeah, I th- I'm hoping when I go back to Toronto next, actually, that I see people doing that. Like, there's a lot of people that are into stoicism in Toronto, so I want to see that on the streets of Toronto, anyone that's listening, like, out there in Canada, like, or anywhere, really, all the major cities. I'd like to see people doing that now if they're into stoicism. No, I, like, in modern society, it's just the same. You know, your family are going to think you're a weirdo. Like, you know, your girlfriend's going to think you've gone crazy. You know, people at work are going to think you're nuts. Like, if you, you know, like, like I said earlier, like when I was a kid, I don't know, I was kind of lucky in some ways that um, the first job I had when I, I, I was uh, kicked out of school when I was a kid because um, I was a bit of a tearaway and I got in a lot of trouble with local cops and stuff. So I had a kind of bad start and it was like the best thing that ever happened to me um, because it made me kind of, you know, rethink things. And, uh, you know, what was going to say, the... Uh, Anyway, it made me it made me realize, you know, that I had to kind of find a sense of a direction and purpose in life. And I was lucky because I found a I stumbled into a pretty well paid job in the tech industry. Um, and I walked out on it to go and do a degree in philosophy. And Pete, I remember at the time people saying, "Are you crazy? Like, if you do a philosophy degree, like, how are you going to get a job at the end of it? You've got a really sweet." You've landed on your feet here, buddy, they said. Like, and are you nuts? Like, people would give their right arm, like, to be where you... I was only 19 or something like that. Uh, and I thought... I remember thinking at the time, though, I think, I think this is meaningless. I don't want to just, like, sit in this office, even if I'm getting paid well for it. I thought, do I want to do this for the rest of my life? Like, sit in an office and kind of shuffle paper and draw diagrams and stuff? Like, so I walked out on it. But I remember as a young guy that feeling of everybody around me look, looking at me like I'd lost my mind and thinking that, you know, I was abandoning something that they thought was really valuable, but they were all wrong. Like, it's, it was all the BS and smoke and mirrors of society. It was a great job. It was like a prison sentence, like Plato's Cave or something like that. You know, I got paid a kind of comfortable amount of money for doing something that to me was like, would be like sitting in a prison cell all day. You know, well, I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. You know, I'd rather be broke like, and have the freedom to sit around and, and talk nonsense to strangers about uh, ancient Greeks like we're doing now, <laughs> like you and I are doing here. You know, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that. You wouldn't be able to enjoy the, the pleasure of my company. How can people overcome that inertia? Societal, they, norms, societal norms are strong. You know, the desire to be wanted yeah. and liked and accepted is is important and someone thinks hey that sounds like me donald you're talking to me i don't feel fulfilled in my life i don't know my values my yeah. meaning but i'm also shit scared of leaving this cushy job and what will my friends say how do they get over the inertia i think you have to practice in a number of ways i mean the stoics give us a whole barrage of, of techniques to toughen ourselves up i re- like i'm going to go straight for the jugular and say that i think contemplating mortality is a, a you know, like the, the nuclear option in stores. So it's the most powerful technique. Now, I don't think that psychologically is for everybody. If someone suffers from clinical depression and they're suicidal, then am I going to say contemplate your own mortality? Probably not, right? But if someone's fairly resilient and they think they can cope with it, Seneca used to say to himself every night when he went to bed, I'm not going to wake up in the morning. Like, and he'd try and imagine that that was it, his time was up, like he was going to go to sleep and, and, and not wake up the next morning. And he would ask himself, am I, am I good with that? Like, can I look back on my life and, and think, yeah, you know, I can you know, I can rest easy with this. I'm satisfied with how it's been so far. Or if not, like, what am I going to do differently? Marcus Aurelius says, imagine that you're already dead, but you've got an extension. You're on, like, you've got, you're in uh, penalty time or whatever. Like, you've got, you've got some extra time. Right. Like he goes further than saying, imagine that you've only got a day left or whatever. He's like, imagine you're already toast. Like, but they've, they've decided to be generous and give you an extension. <laughs> so that, I think, is a powerful technique. It is. Do you think that the Stoics had much of a sense of humor? Because it's yeah. easy to hear 
this is very serious talk. I'm going to bed contemplating death. I'm waking up contemplating death. Everything's about death and being serious and avoiding emotion. You know? They had a sense that, like, I think there's a couple of ways of refuting this idea. Number one is Socrates is the godfather of Stoicism. Like, you know, Epictetus saying, you know, we, we love Socrates, you should emulate him. No one in their right mind would say that Socrates was like Mr. Spock of Star Trek. They're not two people that you would ever confuse. If you met Mr. Spock in your nightclub or whatever, would you look at him and think, is that Socrates? <laughs> I'd think, what's up with his ears? They'd be like, That's how many drinks have you had? Yeah, exactly. Like, they're not, they're not two people that you would ever... Socrates is, is got, it was very humorous. Um, he's very charming. He's witty. Like, and that, that makes him come across as a more rounded and emotional person. And the Stoics wrote books. Like, the Stoics wrote satires. We have a bunch of Stoic satires from... Uh, Perseus, the uh, it was a friend of Seneca, and uh, Seneca has a, we've got a stupid satire that, that Seneca wrote called the Pumpkinification of Claudius that still survives today, and uh, Chris Ipus, uh, the third head of the Stoa, wrote about jokes, and he actually died laughing at one of his own jokes about a donkey. What well, you got like a, a heart attack or something? Yeah, like, it's like, have you seen that Monty Python sketch about the joke in the First World War? Like, that's so funny that everybody that hears it dies. <laughs> have you never seen that? <laughs> no. Everybody's, you, right, Everyone you else will have done. I'm getting abuse yeah, yeah, in yeah. the comments for that one, yeah. So the, the, the government, the British government in the First World War, they say, well, it's so dangerous, we had to translate it into German, but we, we'd only give each person one word so that nobody knew the whole joke. Like because if they heard it, they would die laughing at it. And then they start, they train these guys like they're you know like they're they're, like they're putting um, earplugs in and they're shouting it out uh, uh, like along the trenches at the Germans. So dead like it's a deadly weapon, like the funniest <laughs> joke in the world. <laughs> you can see but how besides, people might think that though, right? With about the Stoics, it's a, it sounds like a serious sort of thing. How do you marry this incredibly uh, sort of existential view of life with being jovial and and, and free? Who's more hardcore than the Stoics, but their predecessors, the Cynics? And the Cynics were known for satires and humor. Diogenes, the Cynic, is one of the funniest. We, to a large extent, we only know. We don't have any books by him. We only know about him from anecdotes. And a lot of those anecdotes come from comedies, come from satires. There's a weird relationship. Marcus Aurelius loved um, old comedy, like, uh, you know, the, the early style of, of Greek comedy. There's... There's like a weird um, relationship between Greek comedy in particular and philosophy. Um, like Greek comedy had these stock characters where there would be like a really pretentious guy and then like a yokel that would kind of act dumb, uh, like feign ignorance, but but somehow always kind of get the upper hand over the, the pretentious aristocrat. This is They thought this was hilarious, right? Um, so they had a lot of comedies that revolved around this. And a lot of people have said, that's weirdly like Socrates, though. Like, because he says, I know nothing, and he just asks lots of questions. You know, and he does it in this good humored way, but he always seems to get the upper hand over these aristocrats and experts that, you know, and he said his Socratic method was a, a therapy, a therapia for um, a talking cure. It uses words rather than uh, pharmaceuticals or drugs or her herbs. Uh, but he said it's a. He says this very clearly several times in the apology. People often don't notice it. Uh, what was it a cure for? He says it was a, consure, a cure for arrogance or conceit, which the Greeks, they'd be like, that's like the comedies. That's the whole point of, of the old comedies. It's puncture, busting the bubble of, of people's arrogance and conceit. So it's a really weird thing that everybody must have looked at Socrates and thought he resembles this buffoon in, in comedies. And yet, like the Delphic Oracle, like the pagan pope, in a sense, like it says that no man is wiser than this buffoon. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's a weird, deeply. Uh, Socrates fascinates me. I mean, I think he's like this, like vortex of an, one paradox or enigma within another. He's a, such a multi-layered uh, character. Um, but yeah, like that's a big part of it. So comedy, I think, is a big part of. It. I think you can only really laugh at yourself. And laugh at life if you kind of gain this freedom that comes from questioning, um, you know, the, the the some of the values that that prevail in our 
our society. I, th- I think of it as actually a liberating thing and, and, and quite the opposite of, uh, you know, the stultifying uh, gravity that, you know, really I think is a more of a, a sign of everything the Stoics were, were trying to, to uproot and challenge. Is there a, a quote that you come back to the most from Stoicism? Was there a, a shot through the heart when you read it, something that particularly had a, a heavy impact on you or anything that comes to mind? It's hard, actually, because I studied the Stoics so closely and for so many years, like 25 years or something now. And um, so I'm like, oh, like all of it, really. But my, actually, my favorite quotes are things like um, Seneca says, to learn how to die is to unlearn how to be a slave. And I think that's, that's like that's pretty heavy. Like there are many things that I read in the Stoics. And I think, wow, that's heavy. Um, so that's one of my one of my favourite ones. And everyone likes that quote from Marcus Aurelius, where he says, "Stop arguing about what it means to be a good man and just be one." Like I picked up for the first time, for the first time ever, I picked up in the Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt, the whole universe is change and life itself is but what you deem it. And it's yeah. those last eight words, life itself is but what you deem it, like is a, such a mic drop. He, like that quote in, in Marcus Aurelius is, and by the way, like I think the other thing I want to see when I get back to Toronto, like my, kind of, my, my current home sort of, is I want to see all these hipsters that are into stores, all the millennials that work in the tech industry, walking backwards. And I want them all to have that tattoo like that says life is change. Uh, like the, the whole universe, universe change. Life is opinion is the, the, the way it's often translated, right? What Marcus Aurelius does there is his two favorite philosophers are Heraclitus and Epictetus. So Heraclitus is this pre-Socratic philosopher that said, uh, uh, "Pantare, everything flows like a river. You can't step into the same river twice because it's new water that's constantly flowing through." It. And he said the whole universe is impermanent everything is in flux which reminds me of a joke like this is one of my few philosophy jokes how many heraclitians does it take to change a light bulb i don't know only one but he can't change the same light bulb twice <laughs> right i'm not even sure that makes sense i don't it? think it does no <laughs> it's all kind of funny you can't step into the same river twice is yeah, what yeah, yeah. Is, right and so Marcus really loves him and he quotes him a lot. All of, his philosophy was always associated with Stoicism. Um, and then his other favorite philosopher, his, his main favorite philosopher actually is Epictetus. And so that quote, it's six words in Greek, right? So it's really concise. Um, and he's, he's referring to Heraclitus, the universe is change. That's Heraclitus's philosophy. And the other bit that says life is opinion is referring to Epictetus. What's, sorry, Donald, what's the alternative translation that you're using there? Because I've said life itself is but what you deem it. And what's, what's your one? Life is opinion. Life is opinion is how it's often... The word he uses is uh, um, uh, hypolipsis, um, which kind of means... Actually means like a value judgment. Um, mm-hmm. So he said what he's really saying, because he explains it actually in the preceding paragraph, right? He's saying this is his way of summing up the whole philosophy of Epictetus. So it's a, sh- a shorthand way of saying it's not things that upset us, but our opinions, our value, it's the same word, like uh, apolepsis. So it's our value judgments that upset us. So what he means is um, not that everything is opinion, but the quality of our life is shaped by our value judgments like so what we deem things to be is fundamental to our quality of life because it shapes whether we're angry or sad or what our value judgments are uh, it doesn't just mean that everything is subjective like the, the stoics uh, weren't skeptics like that like but he thinks that our opinions and value judgments like we say in cognitive therapy you know are uh, the way we think about life is uh, what shapes our emotional uh, experience. It's fascinating, man. Like, so it's a good tattoo. Like, my, I'll tell you, my other, let's talk about stoic tattoos. That's one of my favorite things to talk about on podcasts. Is that is that common? Yeah, like there's a whole um, like someone showed me a whole web page. There's whole Pinterest boards. Is it like, quotes, or is it like a bust of Marcus? They're mainly Marcus Aurelius's face. Like, okay. And then, and then, like some of them have like a little quote or a symbol or whatever. Um, 
So there's one um, I like that says, nothing terrible has happened to you. And there's one I want to get, the tattoo I want to get is from Epictetus, where he says to his students, um, what does he say? Uh, I think it's something like, uh, do it, it says, uh, it's me, me, uh, epa, uh, oi, poi, I think in Greek. Um, my Greek's a bit rusty. But me, it's, it's very short. It just means uh, do not say, it's hard to translate. It's usually translated as alas. So like, um, I would translate it as saying, do not say what the fuck. Like, do, <laughs> or do not, do not say, do not say, oh no, like, don't freak out, like, is kind of what he's saying. Do not say, alas, is the Victorian uh, English. What's that mean trans- to you? Um, don't impose strong catastrophic value judgments on external events. <laughs> That's such a more, like, <laughs> well elucidated oh, version. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Donald, man, um, I feel like I've I've not even got through half of the stuff that I wanted to do, so I'm going to have to get you back on. Um, but this has been so I haven't much told fun. you about my secret project. Tell us about your secret project. That's what I want to know about. I've got two. I've got two. I'm only going to tell you about one of them. I'm not going to tell you about you the other tease. one. Tease. Secret within a secret. Well, I keep telling people about this, like, because I said this in a podcast. So I was talking to some guy in a podcast, and just off the top of my head, I was talking about being in Athens. And I said, you know, the thing that I find a bit sad in Athens is Plato's Academy Park is not far from here. And um, the ruins, we believe, of Plato's Academy School are there. But, you know, like the local Greeks go there, but there's nothing much there. And I said, what I really think we should do is rebuild Plato's Academy like, and make it like an international centre for practical philosophy. So I said that on a podcast a while back and people started, phones started ringing like people started getting in touch with me so my secret project now is we've got a we've got a plan for doing something um vis-a-vis plato's academy park um to maybe kind of get like get people coming there to to learn about philosophy in the you know in the location of the original uh academy like the first ever like educational institution in the history of western civilization it's where it all started. And now it's come full circle. Well, I mean, I, I when I was in Athens, I was so disappointed with this because I, I love tours. I'm a massive fan of a tour. I'll get a, get a, a, a fella on a wireless mic and I'll stick a pair of headphones in and just listen to him and walk and talk for three hours. One of the things I saw on TripAdvisor, as I obsess over it before I go somewhere, was a explanation mm-hmm. of Socrates' philosophy explained through a live socratic dialogue done on an evening time over dinner so you'd go for dinner in this courtyard and there would be an explanation but it was done in the style of a socratic dialogue in Athens, and i was like this is fucking sick and the it was out of season and they were like oh we only do it we only do it in the summer months i thought you bastards that wouldn't surprise me like, but there's not many things like that, but occasionally they crop up. That would be awesome, though. Like, but the I'm always a bit disappointed. Like, I take people. I kind of. I, I I'm one of these people that insists on on telling everybody what everything is, you know. But if people are interested in philosophy, I'd make a great tour guide. Like, because I love taking people and showing them around, and I'm like, no one ever tells you like this is where Socrates was actually executed or the Theatre Dionysus. I call it the place the Athenians used to go to laugh at Socrates. Like, so the theatre on the side of the Acropolis, no one ever tells you that. Like, you know, the Aristotle big one, the, bi- the, the big one with no, the. No, that's you're thinking of the Odeon of Herodes Atticus. Okay. Where the, uh, they have concerts still, mm-hmm. like Sting or whoever will play. The, that's a, like a big uh, theatre. Um, no, there's a smaller one, a little bit, just a little bit along from it. Um, that's you know, like uh, was used in the ancient uh, festival of Dionysus. I think I know the one that you mean. Wasn't it yeah. the one that was closest to what they used as a hospital? And they sometimes wheeled the patients out because they they saw that theatre was part of that. It's just a little bit further down the path, right? Lower down and a bit more toward the main entrance. That's true. Uh, yeah, like it's a lot bit further away. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's towards one of the one of the entrances. People laughed like, at Socrates there. Yeah, like the uh, Aristophanes performed the clouds there, which is like a, a parody of Socrates. There's a story that Socrates went to it and he sat in the audience and there was these two guys 
from Magera, like another city, tourists. And they were like, because it absolutely mercilessly, like, you know, humiliates him, ridicules him, makes him out to be a pretentious idiot. And uh, one of these guys turned to the other guy and he went, who's this dude that they're just roasting here? Like, and Socrates was sitting beside him and he, the story goes that he stood up and he turned around to the audience and he went, it's me. Like, <laughs> like, and then he kind of just sat down and he smiled and he sat. So like the, the symbolism of it is that he didn't, he was, uh, he had apathy. Yeah, he was like, I don't care. Like, what if I ducks back to me? I'm quite enjoying it, actually. Like, <laughs> Man, so good. Look, Donald, uh, I really, really adored today. Uh, if people want to check out more of your work and your accessible writings, where should they go? Well, like, if they just got my website, it's just donaldrobertson.name. So instead of .com, it's N-A-M-E, like donaldrobertson.name. And, like, I've, I have a lot of videos and books, and I'm working on a graphic novel at the moment, so they'll see some of the artwork for that. And uh, yeah, like they'll be hearing shortly about some of the secret, pro- not so secret projects that I'm, I'm working on. I guess if they if they're interested in in that. So yeah, that's where they can find. And also the modern stoicism non-profit. It's like a philanthropic organisation. I'm one of the founding members of it. It's run by a multidisciplinary team of philosophers and classicists and psychologists. So the website for that is just modernstoicism.com, and it runs conferences and online courses like uh you know basically like like i say non-profit so that I, that's where i generally steer people towards actually like they can support the the work of the organization and just educating people about the benefits of stoicism how to be a roman emperor is the most accessible work do you think a good place to start that i've written um yeah i mean it's the one that people seem to like um and you know i wrote a teach yourself self-help book called uh, stoicism and the art of of happiness like i've written a bunch of books but like the one that people seem to like is how to when i first i suggested that title 10 years ago and the a first publisher told me they thought it was a stupid idea for a title and uh and i thought i never i never gave up like i thought i thought i like it it is a stupid title i think it's a stupid title but that's why i like it and uh, eventually i managed to find a publisher that would let me use it and now suddenly they think it's a great idea. They're like, oh, that's a great title. Like, Only but, in uh, retrospect. In retrospect. But at first everybody thought it was kind of, it was funny. Um, so, yeah, by all means, the Romanian translation just came out. I saw. Congratulations, all the people in Romania right. getting red-pilled about stoicism. Quite excited about that. The Greek translation is doing okay. I like that. I like it when I see the Greeks reading it. Like, you know, because they're not really that into stoicism. So like, I quite like to see that crazy look mate yeah. thank you so much for today it's been amazing oh it's been a pleasure thank you very much and you know like uh yeah maybe hopefully some point in the future like we can chat again i'm sure there'll be plenty to talk about Love.